you and want to learn and want to grow and just want to please you with their lives. We pray for your protection today on this place. We pray for our nation as a whole. As, Lord, many bad things are happening, this, uh, the death of this uh, young man and, and all that's going on that's causing a little bit of chaos. And I just pray you'll be with our nation. Heal our land and help our land and help those that know the truth be able to share with others. And I pray you will turn the tide, Lord, in uh, the direction that we're going. Be with our leaders. Give them wisdom, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me if you would. Turn to page number 413 in your hymn book. Page 413. Faith is the victory. In camp along the hills of life, she Christian soldiers ride. Sunday school, morning service at 11 o'clock, and the evening service at 5 o'clock, so it's just good to see you here. It's good to see you a little bit scattered, which is a good thing. You kind of sit with family if you can, and kind of use your social distancing uh, directions there, guidelines there, and uh, keep it like this if you can for the next couple of weeks. We're just going to work our way through this again, and looking forward to getting back to what God wants us to do. There's not very much planned in the month of June as far as children's meetings and that kind of thing. We are going to have Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night services, and it's back to normal for the month of June, and that's going to be the key things I hope you want to be a part of and come. And I know each service, each message will be helpful to you. Uh, it will, we're, as pastors, we're learning things about what we've been through, and we're, getting, we're studying the Bible, the Bible what, what the people need, and I pray that you would see that Church is essential Amen. for your spiritual life. And without it, you can't be all that God wants you to be. And so that's the idea right now, is to think about why you come and why we, why we have things, certain things, why we do certain things. And so every service in the month of June is going to be geared toward helping us know why we need these services and why it's important to come. And so that's the idea for this morning. And I want to say thank you for coming. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Brother Chuck, why don't you come pray for us, please? 
Uh, Daryl, we come to you today. We just thank you this time that we can meet once again in, in your house. We pray, Lord, that you would be with each one here, that you would give us a sense of security. Lord, we have uh, gone over, over out of our ways to try to make sure that our building was safe, not only from the virus, but from any kind of predators that might be uh, willing to come inside. Pray that you be with our service today, be with our song service, be with the pastor as he speaks. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Turn to page 89. Page 89, all the way my Savior leads me. and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. John 11, 25. This old favorite was inspired by disappointment. James Black was calling roll one day for a youth meeting at his Methodist church in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. One name didn't answer, young Bessie, the daughter of an alcoholic. Crest fallen at her absence, James commented. Oh God, when my own name is called up yonder, may I be there to respond? Returning home, a thought struck him while opening the gate. Entering the house, he went to the piano and wrote the words and music effortlessly. Years later, this song comforted a group of traumatized children in a Japanese concentration camp. In his book, A Boy's War, David Mitchell tells of being in boarding school in Shefu, China during the Japanese invasion. On November 5th, 1942, the students and faculty were marched from their campus and eventually ended up in Wyson concentration camp. Among the students was Brian Thompson, a lanky teenager. One evening, about a year before the war ended, Brian was restless, waiting for the evening roll call, which was long overdue. A bare wire from the searchlight tower was sagging low 
and some of the older boys were jumping up and touching it with their fingers. I got a shock off that, said one. Brian decided to try. Being taller than the others, his hand was drawn into the wire and it came down with him. When his bare feet hit the dead ground, the electricity shot through him like bolts of lightning. His mother, who had been interred with the students, tried to reach him, but the others held her back, or she too would have been electrocuted. Finally, someone found an old wooden stool and managed to detach the electrical wire, but it was too late. At roll call that night, when the name Brian Thompson was called, there was no answer. David Mitchell Lega wrote, quote, our principal and Mr. Hefton led a very solemn yet triumphant funeral service the next day. The shortness of life and the reality of eternity were brought home to us with force as Paul Bruce related that Brian had missed the roll call in camp, but had answered the one in heaven. How important it is for us to sing and know, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Stay with me one more time and turn to that song. 566 in your hymn book. The crow is called a gun. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, the time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore. And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. On that bright and calmest morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory of his risen. When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the Freedom Focus with us, and we learned some things about him last Sunday school hour, I mean, last Sunday morning, and then he preached for us and showed, shared a lot of things with us yesterday and then last week. We learned about a need that he has, about um, needing uh, financial support for his family, and also for a $1,000 uh, to help pay off this particular building that they were able to purchase. They wanted to be able to enter into the remodel of this building debt-free, and so they need 500 people giving $1,000 and then it will be paid for. And of course, he's doing some fundraisings and trying to get that up and going, but we want to be a part of that if we can. And so as a church family, I want you to consider individually giving something toward Freedom Focus. And uh, I've given something this morning, uh, just extra from my tithes and offerings to go toward Freedom Focus. And I'm gonna encourage you to do the same thing this morning. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna have my wife play an uh, offertory and there's plates up front you can bring your money to. We're not going to be able to pass the plates around for a couple more weeks like that. There's plates in the back. So as she's playing, just feel comfortable to just go around and put your money in the plate that way this morning, okay? So as she plays, we're going to pray together, and then we'll have the altar. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for what you're doing in our lives. Thank you for working 
uh, in us to be able to be here today and uh, just give us the time we can regather again. We pray for your full blessing upon this meeting. We pray you'll bless this offering at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Hebrews, 
Hebrews chapter number 10. And uh, looking forward to be able to be back in the service here and, and preaching like this. Of course, you're, we've been such out of pocket, we're doing so many different things as of late. And so pray for me this morning as I enter behind, back behind the pulpit here and so forth. Hebrews chapter number 10 this morning, we're going to look at a, a familiar passage of scripture. And because it's familiar, please don't turn off your thinking caps, okay? And, and work with me through this passage, and may the Lord help us be able to leave here with some spiritual nutrition uh, from God's Word. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse number 19. Hebrews 10 and verse number 19. The Bible says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now, before we go any further, how important is the blood of Jesus? It's pretty important, isn't it? Let's go back to years and years ago, the, whoever invented, invented the vaccine for polio. I don't know who he was, what his name was, maybe you might know, but someone invented the vaccine for polio. And uh, children and people were dying right and left because they didn't have a medication for this sickness of polio. But someone found a cure. And uh, they introduced that cure to the medical field. And now doctors can prescribe a medication for polio. What a wonderful thing that is, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, for people who had polio, there was something that was important, a medication that was needed. We just read just now in verse number 19 that, that we have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Amen. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We're here today because of the blood of Jesus Christ that has uh, been the atonement for our sinful condition. Our disease, our sickness of sin condemns us to the lake of fire, but because of the blood of Jesus, you and I can sit here today excited about knowing Jesus, and we've been, he's applied that blood upon um, our hearts. We've been justified, and God doesn't see us, us anymore as sinful creatures. He sees us as redeemed people because the blood has been applied. You see, those of us that know that we're saved and we have the blood applied upon our hearts then we are redeemed people. We're different people. We have a boldness that other folks would not have when it comes to the assurance and security of our salvation. Let's keep reading verse number 20. The Bible says, By a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is, that is to say, his flesh. There's a new way. Verse 21, and having an high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see, see the day approaching. This morning I want to preach a message entitled, And So Much the More. And So Much the More. The book of Hebrews is a great book of the Bible, a Bible written. A book of the Bible, a letter written to the Christians, the Hebrew Christians, the Jews, the Christians that were, the Jewish people that were saved and were once had the old covenant and once they followed the Old Testament principles, letter by the law, and they tried to obey the law letter by letter and try to just, they had to work their way to, to God. Judaism, in a sense, they had a, a law they were living by. But then Jesus came, remember, and he came and was born of a virgin. He, was, he came in flesh, and he lived a perfect life, a sinless life. And he went to the cross, the crucifixion, 
the cat of nine tails, and he, from the top of his head to the bottom of his toes, he shed his blood for the sins of mankind. Was placed into a tomb, a borrowed tomb, praise the Lord. On the third day, he arose again. And because of Jesus, and uh, we find the book of Hebrews is teaching us many things about Jesus. The theme of Hebrews is this. Jesus is better. Amen. Jesus is better. And begins to introduce to us, through the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, it talks about the Son, the Son of God, being so much better than what they knew before. In other words, the Messiah was, was clear. He, he, he is the Messiah. And he did what was, he was supposed to do for us to be saved and have peace with God, this new and living way, which was the blood of Jesus Christ and the person of the Son. In chapter 2, he gives us a commandment to earnestly heed to the things we have heard. He says, you listen, hey, you know him now. He's better. Listen, put a, a leaning ear toward about Jesus. Hey, go to, go to Sunday school. Go to church. Get a book open. Read God's word. And, and the things that you heard about Jesus, take heed on the things that you've heard about him. Chapter 3, he gives us this command to consider the apostle, the sent one, this High priest, this new high priest, his name is Jesus. And chapter 3 talks about Jesus being the great high priest. This apostle, this sent one from the Father who came down to be our intermediator now, our mediator, our lawyer. When we have a sin problem, we don't go to a priest on earth who has the same problem we have. We go to the great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is on the right Behind the throne of the Father right now on the majesty of one high, and he's the one that we go to, and Jesus Christ intercedes and speaks on our account. And he has record that our names in the book of life. We've been born yeah. again. He has our birth certificate secure, doesn't he? He's our great high priest. Consider who Jesus is as our great high priest. In chapters 4 and 5, he's introducing us this idea. Let us come boldly unto the throne of grace to find help in time of need. Not just for salvation and for our sins, but you and I, we're in, we're in human flesh. We have needs. We have emotional needs, financial needs, family needs. We're very needy individuals. And because of who Jesus is, and he's so much better than Aaron was, we can come to him. He says, come boldly to me to find grace to help in time of need. Chapter 6 and 8, he, he kind of just prods us on. He says this, let's go unto perfection. He says in chapters 1 through 6, Christ is better. Now that you have him, know who he is, and because of who he is and your access to this great high peace, priest, let us go unto perfection. Let the Christ, the high priest, perfect you. Let him complete you. Let him build you up and exhort you that you're somebody who's complete in him. He's who you need and make sure you kind of get onto the pathway on this journey of perfection. And that's what he's, that's what he's there for. He says, he tells us in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse number 1, if you'll look there for a moment. In Hebrews 8, 1, now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. If you add all these things up, addition, right? If you add all these things up, this is what it equals to. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. A minister of the sanctuary, of a true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. And he began to talk about how wonderful Jesus is as our high priest. And this verse tells us exactly 
where he is. Jesus, we know exactly where he is. He's on the right hand of the majesty of the throne high. He's on the right hand of the Father, Amen. interceding for us today. And then in chapter 9, he talks to us about how he explains that Jesus Christ is our mediator of the New Testament. As Aaron was the high, the high priest of the Old Testament and how that particular um, tradition was in the Old Testament of having a human high priest who would do certain things once a year and had daily duties to take care of the house of God and, and the temple of God and, and so forth. Chapter 9 introduces us to Jesus Christ being the one who is at work every day. Our Father, he, he doesn't slumber or sleep. He's on assignment. He's on his post. And he's doing the work that he has given us to be the mediator of the New Testament. Now you and I today here, we're New Testament Christians. If you follow the book of uh, the, the Gospel records and what Jesus Christ taught the apostles, you read the book of Acts and you see uh, the continuing Christ and the work of Christ and, and how the church began to mushroom and then be scattered as seed throughout the whole, whole world. And how these apostles turned the world upside down that Jesus Christ is that mediator for the New Testament. And this morning I want you, if you would, to look at Hebrews chapter 10 now and look at a few things about the importance of of Christ the importance of the church and what the church actually benefits you just as the, the vaccine for polio took care of the sickness of polio just as the blood of Jesus Christ takes away is the cure if you would for human sin and human nature and gives us freedom in Christ Freedom from the power of sin, the presence of sin, but freedom from heaven to go to hell and the, the penalty for sin, the blood of Christ does for us. Now in chapter 10, we find Jesus, the Bible, the, the Hebrew author here, the letters to us, is introducing us to the importance of this idea of, the, of Christ's work. Now, he's the mediator of the church, the New Testament. He's the one that's working uh, in people's lives, the church, the Holy Spirit, I'm sorry, Christ and the Holy Spirit, and then he has this place called the church. This, this, this assembling of believers, this gathering of believers, and how it has a purpose. There's a plan for the church, and, and we got to determine our hearts as we leave here today that this, this particular, particular church meeting, this gathering of Galilean Baptist Church's members, it is essential. It's important. And the thing that this church possesses and its purpose is very valuable. And it is essential. And uh, it needs to be in, in it needs to be a movement of God. And it's so much the more as we see as they approach it. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10 once again and begin looking at the verse number 22. 22. As he lays the foundations through 1 through 9, now he have a new living way. His name is Jesus. His flesh came. He's now our high priest. In verse number 21, he's the high priest over the house of God. The New Testament church. He's the, house, he's the priest over us. Individually. But as a church, the house of God. Look at verse number 22. The Bible says this. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let's think about the purpose of the church and, and how you and I need to look at Christ's work, the Holy Spirit's work in this world in 2020 and see what needs to be going on and so much the more. First of all, we should, this verse 22 says, let us come together clean. Let us come as a church clean. This verse says, first of all, it says, let us draw near with a true heart, with an honest heart, with a pure heart. 
for the church of the New Testament, the work of God is to, uh, the Holy Spirit's work is to convict men of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And God says this, this coming together, there's a purpose for us coming together. It, has, it is for us come together with a true heart. I was able to talk to someone yesterday. We gave the gospel to a, a, a wonderful couple, and, and Tim got saved. This is a glorious thing. He'll be here tonight in church, and, and Lord willing, we'll be able to disciple him and his dear wife, and, and uh, it's a great thing. But one thing about the conversation we were having yesterday was the honesty of the two people we were talking to. They were so open and honest about who they were. They were confessing sin. Brother Chris Hunter and I went visiting yesterday. We visited a couple that needed the Lord, and, and he got saved yesterday, which is a great thing. They came Wednesday night. We visited again Saturday and all that. But as we were witnessing them and giving them the gospel, that, they, that God loves them, that they're a sinner, when we got to the point they were a sinner, they were coming clean. They were so ready for salvation because they were so honest. You know, this idea of church is that we come to church clean, with a true heart. Now, you know, none of us are perfect. We're all sinners. Amen. But we must be willing to admit that we have, we have problems. A church is not a place where there's perfection, sinless people, but it is a place where we can come and come clean. Come with an honest heart, with a true heart, the Bible says. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Having our heart sprinkled. Now that, that idea, these Jewish people, these Hebrew people understood this sprinkling, because the high priest in the Old Testament would enter into, and they had these ceremonial type things they would do, and one thing they would do was dip their finger and dip maybe a cloth or something in blood, and they would sprinkle the, all, sprinkle the altar to covering for sin. And so Jesus said, or the author says in Hebrews, he says here, come clean. Come being willing to admit your sin, be a true heart, and know that you need God's atoning blood upon your heart from an evil conscience. And our bodies washed with pure water. So the first thing, the first thought here, verse 22, is this idea of the church and this getting together. He said, let's come clean with a true heart. Having a heart sprinkled of pure con from an evil conscience. Remove this evil conscience. Remove this, these thoughts that are not good. Unhealthy thoughts. This evil conscience that you had. Come clean with that. Let the blood of Jesus cleanse you. And our bodies washed with pure water. He says, let us come clean. This idea of the New Testament church and what we need so much the more of is when we come to the house of God, we come with a prepared heart, with a tenderized heart, with honesty all about us, the evil conscience removed, ready to hear, look here, the words of Scripture, which the Bible says is the washing of the water by the Word. Don't ever get bored in Sunday school with reading God's Word. Never get bored if the pastor uses too much Bible. Because the scripture is the washing of the water by the word. We come to be clean. We come with the Holy Spirit's work of using his word, the sword of the spirit, to, to convict us of impurities, an evil conscience, we need our bodies washed with a pure conscience. One of the, one of the uh, things that I hope and pray that we all missed during the, the separation period is the convicting work of His Spirit. And many of us, we've been watching messages on live stream, haven't we? 
You may have read more Bible and listened to more messages at home. Maybe you haven't recently than even come to church. I don't know what your schedule's been like. But if you haven't been doing that, you're, can you imagine after the rapture takes place and the Holy Spirit leaves the earth and there's no Holy Spirit conviction in this, no light and no salt? When the Christians are gone, the Holy Spirit's gone, this world's going to be empty. It's going to be a mess. You know, our lives would be a mess without every once in a while the Holy Spirit taking His Word and convicting us through His Word of anything wrong in our lives. You see, showers are important. That's pretty profound, isn't it? Hygiene is good for your body, Amen. but it's also good for your spirit and for your soul. And that's the job of the church is to have the Word of God presented in such a way that the Holy Spirit's able to take the Scriptures, not less Scriptures, but more Scriptures, to bring cleanliness, the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. Let us come, gather together, so much the more, for cleanliness, for cleanliness. Number two, in verse number 23, the Bible says this, and let us hold fast, the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. The second challenge or the charge for us about this so much the more challenge. Let's hold fast the profession of our faith. Let us come committed. Let us come committed to the task at hand. The Bible says let us hold fast the profession of of our faith without wavering. Those two, that whole phrase, the word hold fast, it has the idea of fighting for something you believe in. Why do you come? Why do you gather so much the more in 2020? You come because you believe in something. As we review our Constitution and we think about why we're here, why we want to be a part of a church like this, and why do we come together? Why do we give our offerings? Why do we uh, volunteer to be an usher? Why do we uh, build on a security team? Why do we uh, be able to be a deacon? Why do we volunteer to do things around the church? Because we believe in this place. There's a, there, there's a certain profession. There is a, a body of doctrine. There is a, a, a truth, a belief system that we hold dear in our hearts. And it causes us to volunteer ourselves and become, become a part of the body to carry out this great commission that was handed down by us, by Jesus Christ himself. And he says, hold fast. That means fight for. And when I was a kid, I had my toys or my basketball or my bat. And if my brother wanted my bat, I would get my bat and hang on to it tightly, and John may be pulling this way, but I said, no, it's my bat. It was mine. It was dear to me, and so I grabbed it tightly and said it was mine. I'm committed to fight for that bat. The Bible says we come together in so much more because we're holding fast to the, to the profession of our faith without wavering. We must come and gather together and so much the more we must come committed to the cause that we're here for. There's a purpose why you're here. You're not just here. I'm sorry to tell you this. You're just not here to fill a space in some pew. There's a purpose in which you're here. And all of us will do different things and be a part of different ways. But you're here because you believe something. And you're committed to the task at hand. And it's essential that we meet and that a church has committed gatherers. He says, oh, we have a high priest. It's so wonderful. Come clean, he says. Let us come committed for he is faithful that promised. Isn't that wonderful? Some of us get weary, don't we? 
and working. We get tired and weary. And is it worth it? I mean, I'm tired. No, I don't want to keep doing this. I mean, there's some, is there something else I can do more important than this? Those thoughts go to our minds when we're tired and when we're hungry, when we're weak physically, when we're weak spiritually. But so much the more, we must come with the idea of why we're here and committed to the cause. Number three, let's look at verse number 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. We must come. Let us come together considering one another. We must come considering one another. You know, you and I, we're, if, we're, if we're saved, we are naturally light and salt. But the salt has lost its savor. What use is it? Would it be thrown down and just stomped on as sand or gravel or whatever? A path for a path for people to walk on. It's not got any savor to it. You and I are supposed to be light. The things that we do, not on Sunday morning inside the building, but the things that we do are supposed to be with the mindset of considering one another. As a parent, uh, this is always upon us. You know, the things that I laugh at, the things that I joke about, the things that I take lightly, the things that I take seriously determine the perception of my children. Do I consider one another with my activities? Do I consider one another with my actions? Do I consider the, the, uh, one another with the idea of, of helping or what, what it causes other people to think about my God and my Savior, my church, or who Jesus is? You see, we come to the purpose of coming together is for the purpose of considering one another. And no Christian is exempt from this. Oh, I just, I'm, I'm an invisible person. <laughs> You're not an invisible person. I'm sorry. You have a body. Amen. And because man looks on the outward appearance, it's very important that you look the part. It's important. Man looks on the outside. This couple that got saved yesterday. The only reason they got saved is upon this one. I'd like to figure out is because of two reasons. Number one is because they saw a testimony of their neighbors. They said, those two people there, they don't ever fight. They don't ever fuss. They don't have back music playing around everywhere. They, they just get along with each other. They have a great testimony. Those folks are the real Christians over there. And then one of the lady was a Filipino. And I had a Filipino mission with me. And the neighbor said, well, there's a Filipino next door. We will go over there. We talk to her, and she tells us about herself and what her need is and her need for Christ and all these things. And, but it was because of a neighbor who was light to another neighbor and showed them what a true Christian is supposed to look like. This idea of coming and getting together and so much the more is let us come considering one another. Now we find the word here in verse 24 is the word provoke. The word provoke. I'm gonna, I'm gonna confess to you a sin I had as a kid. I was a bad boy. And I feel sorry, so sorry for my older brother John. Because I was a bad boy. I would provoke John to hit me or to chase me. And then John would get the spanking. It's terrible. That's an awful sin. It's terrible. So I'd revoke him to hit me so he would get in trouble. That's happened today right now, by the way, in a lot of places too. Because of provoking. That's a bad provoking, right? This verse here uses the word provoke in a good way. It says this. Let us consider one another to provoke. 
to stir up some emotions, to stir up some excitement, to stir up some uh, cause to make someone go beyond themselves and, and do something. It says, provoke unto love and to good works. I don't know of any better organization on this earth than the local church than the gathering of God's people so we come together and then God's people that we have it's a place where a handshake, a smile, a Sunday school lesson, a Bible verse, a phone call, a text, a, a visit in the home, whatever. But when we come together, the songs that we sing, a special that is given, that what's it do? It stirs us up. It provokes us to love God and to love one another. It provokes us to go beyond our selfishness and go out and do something good for somebody. The purpose and the, the church is essential because we're light and we salt to a very dark world who needs love Amen. and who needs good works being demonstrated. And the church is the gathering place. It's the rally. It's the pep rally for provoking one another to go do something good and with love. Let us, the Bible says, consider, come together to consider one another. You senior saints that are out there, we're missing so many senior saints in our service this morning because of the, uh, the virus. And they're not here on purpose. They're afraid that they may catch the virus. And so they're, they're, they're cautious about that. We don't shame that at all. But uh, we miss the senior saints. We miss their encouragement. We miss their prayers. We miss what they're doing for the cause of Christ. Don't ever think because if I don't go to church today, it's, it, it's not a big deal. If I choose not to gather this month, no one's going to miss me. Guess what? That's not true. Your faithfulness to the house of God in your senior saint years is important. You young person, oh, no one's gonna, if I don't come to church, no one's going to miss me. That's not true. The, the young people is a future generation. You need these truths deliver, delivered to you. and We've got to consider what we've got to provoke others. You millennials out there, you think you're invisible and you can just kind of filter through life and just do your own thing behind a screen? There's, there's value there. But please know that coming together, you coming together is for the purpose of provoking one another to love and to good works. What Matthew did for us this morning was wonderful, wasn't it? I'm sorry, this pastor can't do that. I said, where did you get all this information at, Matthew? Well, it's all on the internet. This millennial, or, or you pre or after, I don't know what you, where you are right now. Are you a millennial? I'm a millennial. <laughs> Without him here, in the time in which God has given him, this church is, is lacking something. He's bringing something to the table that this communication skill is needed for such a time as this. Amen. And he's a millennial. That's positive, folks. He has... Brought some things to the table for us and provoked us to loving and to good works. Thanks be to God. Amen. Why do we gather together in so much the more to consider one another and provoke to love and to good works? Amen. Number four, look at verse number 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The fourth thing I want you to write down is let us come and keep on coming. <laughs> let us come and keep on coming. There's no stopping point until Jesus Christ raptures the church. And all God's people said, Amen. It's time to come and come and come. Come and come and come. Because the Bible says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. 
Don't look for the next opportunity. You don't have to come to church. That's the wrong perspective. I mean, big. look for the opportunity to get to go to church again. And look here, don't come to church for just yourself. If you come just for yourself, wanting to get blessed and bless yourself, it may not happen every time. But if you come with the idea you're supposed to come, you're going to come and keep on coming to be a blessing, then you're going to get a blessing. Because every time you give of yourself, you feel so good about yourself. All the self, the self-image complex is because people are selfish. And once they learn how to give of themselves, then they, be, that they solve their problem. It's coming and keep on coming. Not forsaking the assailants. So forsake not, it says. That's the command. Forsake not. It says, as the manner of some is. As the manner of some is. Please do not compare yourself to another member. You don't know what they're going through and why they can't come. You don't know their health condition, their work, their work, their work uh, loads. Just because someone else doesn't come faithful doesn't mean you can't come faithful. Don't compare yourself with somebody else as a matter of some people are. Some churches only meet once a week. Some meet twice a week. We, we meet three times a week. Amen. That's the manner in which we meet. We can't say, oh, we're better than somebody else or we're not as good as somebody else. But the point we got to make is we got to, whatever we meet, just coming together, these opportunities to come together, we must keep on coming as a man, not, not as a matter of some is, but how we meet. When we meet. And the purpose behind maybe each meeting, a revival meeting, this type of meeting, a missions meeting, emphasis, a Sunday school training time, a soul reading training time, the time we would have with me, he says, come together and keep on coming together. He says, not as a matter of some others. Don't do what everybody else does. Do what you're supposed to do. Come to the meetings that you're assigned to come to. But come as a matter of not a matter of some is. And then it says this wonderful phrase, and so much the more. And so much the more. It's not less, it's more. Don't come less, come more. So much the more as you see. And in conclusion, as you see the day approaching. How many of you have eyes and you see some things that you know? are signs of his coming. Amen. Jesus is coming soon. And when you see things before your very eyes that are happening, you know the time is near. And so when you know the time is near, that's why you come to church. To prepare yourself for the last days and for heaven. If we have to go through some persecution before he comes, are you spiritually prepared to go through that? We need to be. Guess what? That's what church is for. It's to exhort you, to encourage you, to edify you for the work of the Lord, for the ministry at hand. We see all around us of what's going on. Not less church, but more church. And I want to encourage you, this first time of coming together like this for a long time, I want you to see that the church is essential. Water. How many days can you live without water? How many days can you live without bread? How many days could I live without a Dunkin' Donuts coffee? <laughs> How many days can people live without drinking alcohol? How many days can people live without the food chain of McDonald's? Uh, the holy, not the holy arches, but the holy sea, Chick-fil-A. A week without Chick-fil-A, how do we, we survive? You know, the, our government, during this COVID-19, made some guidelines for all of us. They want us to social distance. They want us to stay at home for a while. Well, there are certain things that were essential. Believe it or not, 
in the grocery store were essential. Bread and water is important. Amen. For some reason, the liquor stores were essential. And probably because of addictions. They probably it's probably psychological. If you want to get real nice to them right now, be nice to the government in that area. It's probably because the people that would have withdrawals from not getting the alcohol or the drugs, the marijuana, right? Those things remained open because the government looked at maybe the little big pictures and we if we Take it away from right now, we're going to have some very frustrated people who are going to do some damage on their wives and children. we got to hold that back a little bit. Are you with me? Though it's wrong and evil, they said it was essential to keep those open. The fast food places were remaining open and they, they did things a certain way. I want to tell you folks, for the Christian, those that believe what we believe in, in this body of doctrine we hold dear to us that we gather every Sunday morning Sunday night and Wednesday night should be essential to your not your physical body as much as is your spiritual life and this day going forward I want to encourage you with your testimony your life to come together clean. Come together committed to the cause. Come together for the purpose of provoking children and others and family members and other church members with your presence to provoke love your works. And to come together and keep coming together until the day God raptures the church because he is coming soon. Would you keep coming? Would you make this an essential part of your life? And may the days ahead, days ahead, uh, as we see our church begin to grow spiritually, become healthy people, that next time something like this happens, the city of Cedar Hill would say, you can't close the Galilean Baptist Church down. Because if you do, the children won't be able to be nourished spiritually and be helped. That addiction person who's, who got saved and his life was changed won't be able to help that, that, that group of people anymore. This, this is a place where families are strengthened. And you can't close the Galilean church down because it's essential to the Cedar Hill City. Because it's helping society. You see the point? We've got to make ourselves essential by not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as a man of some is. But it's one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we thank